from Netronics, and welcome back to my video tutorial series on getting started with FPGA development. Specifically, we've been using the Xilinx toolset Vivado Vitus 2021.1 along with the RDZ7 from Digilent. So far, we've covered how to install the Xilinx tools, exactly what all the steps are in a design, how to create a base design for the RDZ7 in both Vivado from the hardware perspective and in Vitus from the software perspective. And I kind of just wanted to wrap up this tutorial series with um, some basic concepts back down in the HDL side on hardware that you'll probably need as a FPGA developer. Um, common things like state machines, flip-flops, the different types of synchronous versus asynchronous. Uh, that's kind of what I've been aiming for with this whole tutorial series is a really practical getting started guide of how to hit the ground running, developing with um, FPGAs and Xilinx FPGAs in particular. I have come back to my Vivado project that I created for the RD board and I'm going to create a couple new um, Verilog files, so I do have this project in Verilog, but these same concepts are still translatable to VHDL, and you could still easily do these in VHDL, but this project I have set in Verilog, so I'm going to create a couple Verilog source files with some modules showing you how to code up these very basic building blocks that you're gonna need if you're gonna be writing any sort of HDL code yourself in Verilog. So, let's come back to add sources. And when you're creating a new source file, whether that be for Verilog or VHDL, it's going to be referred to as a design source here. Um, a simulation source would be like your test bench file for that particular um, Verilog or VHDL module. And then constraints are, like we covered in the past, are the actual um, endpoint package pin assignments and timing um, constraints outlined. So, create design source, we're gonna hit next. Um, from here, if you have a pre-existing Verilog module that, or VHDL module you want to add, you could hit add files. We're creating a new one. So let's do create file. This is going to be our FSM example. So finite state machine example. And you don't need to include the .v or .vhd. It's gonna automatically append that. And then I'm also going to do our FF example, so our flip-flop example. And we'll just have those modules for now. I can add anything in there later. So hit finish. And then when you create new files, the first thing uh, that Vivado is gonna do on the next page is it's gonna prompt you to go ahead and add some port names. You don't have to do this. This is just kind of like a handy helper tool that Vivado tries to help you with. Since pretty much every module you're gonna create or every file you're gonna create needs an input clock, I normally put an input clock on everything. Um, typically always have a reset. So I'll go ahead and put a reset in each of them. and then click OK and let Vivado go ahead and generate those two files. We're going to start off with, I'm gonna go ahead and open my blank um, flip-flop example here so you can see what all uh, Vivado likes to generate for you. So one of the most basic pieces of logic that you'll need to know how to write is the D flip-flop. There are several different things that you can use that from, everywhere from a latch to a gate that you're using to help meet timing constraints, for instance, if you're violating your hold time, you can add a few gates to slow it down and have your signal drawn out longer. To have your D flip flop, we're gonna go ahead and add another input here. So we're gonna have input our um, D and then our output Q. And since we are actually assigning a value to this, there are two different types of signals in um, Verilog. You have your wire and your register. A wire is simply a signal that's going from one point to another, whereas the register is the type of signal type that you're actually assigning a value to. So when you don't specify anything, the default is a wire. So our clock is a wire in this case, our reset is a wire, 
the input D is a wire. Um, this is all because these are signals just passing through to us. We're not actually a, assigning something into a register. However, our output Q in this case is going to be a register type, um, since we are going to be assigning it th the incoming value of D. Moving on, we have our, the actual base of our clock is we're going to have always at, and then our begin and end statement here. So always at, and then in this block, we have what's called our sensitivity list. So within our sensitivity list, um, what that is is signals that we are monitoring for certain changes in, and whenever there's a change in that particular signal, that's what triggers the rest of the logic within the block. So on the D flip-flop, for example, the clock is in our sensitivity list because the rising edge of the clock is what the D flip-flop is using to control when it's looking at the D input and changing the Q output. So we're going to have our positive edge clock. Now for our flip-flop, it can be one of two things. It can be synchronous or asynchronous. That simply means where are we putting our reset signal? So if we're putting the reset signal up in the sensitivity list with our clock, that makes the D flip-flop asynchronous, meaning that the clock doesn't have to be running for the value to change within the D flip-flop because if the reset were to change states, that could on its own without the clock running, change the value within the D flip-flop. However, if we pull our reset into the um, logic block within the always at statement and not have it in our sensitivity list, that means that we have a synchronous D flip-flop, meaning that the clock has to be running for any changes to happen with our D flip-flop. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this an asynchronous flip-flop. So I'm gonna do or, and I think, can't remember, it was either an active, I think it was an active high reset that I had in the block design. So if it's an active high reset, whenever that means it's normally low and when it goes high, the reset is active. So on that positive edge of the reset, that is when we're in the reset state. So here, this is what I mean. We have our reset in the sensitivity list, making this an asynchronous flip-flop, meaning that the reset signal can manipulate the data within the always at block without the clock running. Now, if we're in reset, begin, end. So begin and end is how you cap everything in Verilog just to make sure, most of it you can do with your indentation, but we wanna make sure we keep everything um, in there. It's kind of like the same as brackets in coding or braces. Yeah, I always call them the same, braces. Um, so if we're in the reset state, that means we're going to have uh, our Q output driven to zero. So, because it's a single bit wide, we have one bit wide, binary zero. So if we're in reset, in the re um, we'll go ahead and drive Q to zero. Else, if the clock is running, we're just gonna go ahead and pass through um, the D value to Q. So Q is equal to our input D. So that's about as basic as you can get with the D flip-flop. There's several different ways to do this. Like I said, you could take, um, leave the reset out of the sensitivity list. So if I took the reset out here, um, if we're in the reset state, that would still apply. You would leave this logic the same, however, uh, the reset wouldn't actually reset the value in the flip-flop unless the clock were running now. That's our first basic piece of logic there. So now that you kind of see the difference of asynchronous versus synchronous, and you've seen how to create um, your logic within an always at block and kind of think through, you've got the basic um, basis of how a D flip-flop works and how to translate that into Verilog you can kind of slowly see how to translate other things like a JK flip-flop or a T flip-flop and move up from there. The other piece of logic that I use a lot is the finite state machine in Verilog. Let's take a quick look at how to set up one of those. I'm just gonna do a very, very basic one. 
And in fact, I've done a pretty basic one in a previous tutorial. So I think I'm just gonna copy and paste that one over just for ease. We'll copy and paste that in here. Okay, so I've got all of my simple state machine. This is just like a dummy state machine. It doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, but just to, just to give you the kind of view of the structure of how I like to code up uh, finite state machines in Verilog. So taking a look at this little, I made a little bubble um, flow graph of exactly what this really simple state machine is doing, just so you can get the visual idea of what's happening. We have six overall states. We're coming into the first state, which is just an, an initialization state. It's the first state we come into at a reset. It's always good to have some sort of initialization state to come into that um, you dump into out of reset. That way you're setting all of your values, outputs and clearing your inputs and everything to some known state. Uh, so after my initialization state, I just set a random output signal high, wait one state, and then I check um, my input signal. And based upon whether or not that input signal is high or low, I'm then gonna go to either state four or state five, which if the input signal is high, I'm gonna set one output signal high, whereas if the input signal is low, I'm gonna set a different output signal high. And then depending on whichever um, state I went to, whether it was four or five, I'm then just gonna go to um, my final state, which is state six, where I'm just sending my done signal high, which is just a signal where it's like the state machine sets says, hey, I'm done. And it's just gonna hang out there in that done state until it sees the reset, which will then uh, kick it back into its initialization state and run through it again. So now that you kind of have a high level visualization of what this particular state machine is doing, uh, let's go take a look at how we implemented that in our Verilog. So as you can see, we've got our input clock and reset signals. And just like I mentioned, we have our uh, output and input signals here. So you notice all of our output values are of register type, since we are actually assigning particular values to each of those um, output signals. We have our input signal. And then below that, so this actual register here, because we don't have it up in the declaration of our module, that means that that particular signal is with, uh, kept within this Verilog module. It's not something that's going to be fed externally or made external, or made externally available to any other um, logic around it. And I call it the state register just because this is the actual register where I'm keeping track of the number state that I'm in. So I keep track of my states by number. Um, and depending on how many states I have is how wide I make this register. So because I have seven states, that means that my register needs to be at least three bits wide because two to the three is eight. So a three bit wide register can count up as high as eight. And if I have seven registers, I need to count to seven. You do want to keep the size of your state register and honestly, any register that you're storing a value in, you don't just wanna make it huge so that you don't think about it type of thing. You want to try to keep it as tightly close to the largest value that I'll ever see for a few reasons. Uh, a, it just, you are limited on resources in your FPGA to some extent. Like I showed you in the actual implementation, your any time that you set a register size, that's part of what's consuming extra logic gates within your design. So when you open up that implement design and you see all the blue that's highlighted of what your design's consuming, having oversized registers that aren't serving any purpose are part of what's gonna waste some of that space. Um, also, especially when you have um, something that you're counting to and you have different states in a register, any, and even in this register, I have one unused state. So that's one potentially unknown state that I could somehow by some weird thing end up in. So by keeping your register as close to the max size number it's going to see also eliminates uh, the number of unknown states that you could get into and the unknown values that it could somehow get configured into that you aren't expecting. So I wouldn't wanna make my state register four bits wide because two to the four is 16 because since I'm only counting up to seven, 
instead of only having one unknown state I could potentially be in, now my six, my four bit register would potentially give me nine unknown states I could be in because I've only coded up my seven. So now that I've explained the state register, what it is, and I have over explained the size bit width of the register, um, next what I do is we have our actual states here. So I set them as actual parameters so I can use a name. I like to name my states. This you don't necessarily need to do. You could still just use the actual numbered values here. Um, I personally just like to have the parameters with state names to make it easier for me to read in the future because I typically try to make the state name close to the general thing that the state is doing. Um, which kind of lends into the next practice of I try not to have too many things happening in one state at a time. Uh, because one really important thing to think about when you are writing HDL code as an HDL developer is you're thinking in terms of clock cycles and you can only do one, like you can only do one action on a piece of logic at a time per clock cycle. So if I have a particular register, I can only manipulate that value in that register once per clock cycle. So if I have two different registers, I could manipulate the values in each of those registers respectively at the same time in one clock cycle, but I can't change the value twice in the same clock cycle in one register. That's by naming the state something, the general idea of what that state's doing, it kind of helps me keep from shoving too many actions into a single state. Now that we've laid out our initial declarations for all the signal names, our state register, our parameters, we're getting into our always at block with our sensitivity list. So I personally like to have my state machines on uh, the asynchronous side. Depending on my application, for the most part, I do want my reset signal to be able to reset my state machine without the clock being present. There are cases where you may not want that. It all depends on your particular application. For the most part, I typically want my state machines to be asynchronous. If, my, if I'm in my reset state, the first thing I do is I clear all of my output signals and I set my state uh, register to my initialization state that I mentioned earlier. So that state that I'm always gonna dump to in the event of a reset. So then, if I'm not in the reset state, I'm in my else and I have a case statement where I am using a case switch in Verilog to switch between my different states. So each state is a uh, case in my case statement. And this is, and you can kind of see a little bit clear here, I could definitely just use the actual numbers of the states. I don't have to have the state names. That's definitely just a personal preference of mine to make it easier for me to read in the future when I come back and look at this. So that's just kind of, as you work more with FPGAs, you'll develop these little kind of stylistic things for yourself. In my initialization state, I'm kind of doing the same thing I did in the reset state where I'm clearing all of my output signals. I'm setting my done signal low since I know that when I'm in the done state, I just hang out there with setting that signal high until I see reset. So I need to set done to zero. And then I set my state register to the first actual state that I'm executing something where I'm setting that output, that first output signal high, which is output signal zero. And then pretty simple in this state. So this state takes one clock cycle to execute. Each state in your statement team takes one clock cycle to execute. I set um, my output signal high, and then I set my state register to my wait one state. So typically, the reason I have this wait one state, so it's one clock cycle that gives the signals I set in my last um, state one clock cycle to settle. So typically, if you have a lot of different state machines running, or if you have a state machine that's feeding signals to some other piece of logic, when you set an output signal high, you do typically want to give it some time to settle. So the reason I have this wait one state um, where I'm doing nothing immediately after I set this output signal high is due to the fact I was making the assumption that I'm setting this output signal high, some other piece of logic somewhere is going to do something based upon the state of that signal at that point in time. And then that's what's setting the input signal I'm about to read in the next state. So essentially I'm just giving an extra clock cycle for that output 
signal to settle and make it where it needs to go after I set it high in the previous clock cycle. Again, this is just a made up scenario, but just kind of talking through the design considerations you need to think about and when you're inserting this logic, what's kind of going on, how it's tying in with everything around it. So after my wait one state where I've let my previous output signal settle, I'm checking the state of the input signal to my state machine. If that input signal is high, I'm gonna go and set um, output signal one high, or if it's low, I'm gonna set output signal two high. And that's, so I'm setting the state register to that particular value. So on the next clock cycle, let's say the input signal was low, that means I'm going to, on the next clock cycle, come to set to out too high, which is where I'm going to set the output signal to high. And then my next state is going to be to set my done signal high. And I'm going to then stay in this state, keeping the done signal set high until I see the reset signal again, which will kick me back into my init state and start this process all over again. As you can see, those are the kind of design considerations you need to take into account with your state machine. You can probably see how like different interactions can start to happen but if you have multiple state machines running and how you can use it to control different pieces of your logic doing different things in parallel. I'm gonna go ahead and just save these two files real quick. And one last thing I wanted to touch on is kind of a basic design uh, example here is We've looked at the block design and how to instantiate our um, processor there. If we're going to have some sort of processor slash CPU in our design, that's also where we can use the nice prepackaged IP from Xilinx. And we talked about how you have to instantiate that block design with a top level wrapper. And this top level wrapper is one that we're letting Vivado auto manage right now. However, it will be very common that you'll need to create your own top level wrapper. And you probably already have the question of like, hey, we created these two other Verilog files, this flip-flop and the state machine. How do we relate them and all tie them together into the same design? Because right now we've just got this flip-flop and the state machine floating off. If I ran synthesis right now, it would just kind of throw it somewhere in logic and it would have no interaction with any of the logic that I've put in the block design. So what I need to do is to create a new top level file that instantiates both my block design and my flip flop and state machine modules so that they can all see each other interact and know how to connect to each other. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add a new design source. And we're just going to call this user top. Click OK, finish. Uh, port name doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna throw one in there. We're gonna override it anyway. So I'm gonna go ahead and open user top. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to come back and oh, reload my wrapper here. So I'm going to copy and paste so I need my DDR connections for the RD and my fixed IO and my, I still want to have access to my switches and my LEDs that I set up in the block design. So I'm going to go ahead and take all of this and here is my actual instantiation of the block design as well as the IO buffers for the signals. I'm going to go ahead and copy this. and then paste it here. So now in my user defined top file, I have instantiated my block design. So if you keep an eye over here, I'm gonna go ahead and save this and you'll notice in my sources hierarchy after it updates. Now under user top, you'll see I also, I have another instantiation of the block design here. Now I'm going to take if I went to instantiate my finite state machine, I'm going to take, I'm going to copy this and over and let's paste it here. So the first thing you do, you have the actual module name you're calling out. 
and then the instance number of it. So I, this is instance zero. And then for each of my signals within, I'm not specifying whether it's input or output here. I'm gonna do dot clock. So let me change all these real quick. So at this level, what I'm doing is I'm just passing the actual signals I want to go to each of these values in this or these signals in the state machine. So that's why I don't need to actually have like the output uh, designator or the register designator here. And then we have our parentheses. So for the clock I'm gonna pass to my state machine, I'm gonna go ahead and pass my system clock. And for our reset, oh, yes, our reset RTL. So we'll go ahead and pass that as the reset signal for our finite state machine. And so we can then also tie, so let's tie our output signals to our LEDs here. So we've got LED zero, I can tie output signal zero to LED one, I'll tie output one to LED two, I'll tie output two to, and then our fourth output LED, we'll go ahead and tie our done signal to. So if we were to run this state machine, we'd see those signals reflected here on um, the LEDs and for the input signal, I think we could probably use one of our, so we could use one of our switches, our switch zero. So if we do, um, we could do switch zero here. So now that I save that, you'll notice that our um, finite state machine example module is now pulled up into the user top file here. And we can do the same real quick with our flip-flop example. So flip-flop, we can name this flip-flop zero. And then our same thing, we can copy and paste it. We can have the same clock and reset signals going to it. Definitely don't have this indented right, but that's okay for now. I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, and then D and Q. So because I don't have any other signals, I'm just gonna go ahead and create a couple dummy signals here. In just to tie them to here. So you can kind of see how we would create signals at the top level to coordinate with each other. A few moments later. Oh, I had a period instead of a comma there. That's why that was, I was like, that's a weird syntax there. Okay, so when I, now when I save it, you'll also notice that our flip-flop example is pulled up into our user top file. However, we haven't actually set our user defined top file as the top file in the project. You'll notice that the RD um, BD wrapper top auto-generated HDL wrapper that we did earlier is still technically a top file. So to change that, we'll right click on user top and simply select set as top. Now that we have that set as the top file within the design, um, if we were to run synthesis and implementation, again, we'd still have the top file that's instantiating our, our block design and then our state machine and our flip-flop example. However, um, it would still instantiate another copy of our um, block design under the 
RDZ7 block design wrapper, and then you'd have some conflicts because technically the constraints will be trying to map those to the same thing. So what we'll want to do is we'll want to go ahead and disable the auto-generated file. So it's not deleting it. Um, in fact, if I made any um, changes to the block design, I would just re-enable that auto-generated Movado one, set that back as the top, and then make my changes to the block design so Movado could regenerate um, all of this code here for me, just because it's a lot easier to let Movado go ahead and auto-generate anything it can. Just because, like I said, there's a lot of underlying pointers in the Movado software that can easily get messed up when you try to try to start manually overwriting things. So I try not to manually override things if I can. But overall, uh, that shows you how to start adding your own Verilog code in uh, conjunction with your block design and any IP you put in the block design. Again, all of this would carry over. These are all the same principles as if you're using VHDL. Um, so the only differences are syntax between the Verilog and VHDL here. I hope this video is helpful and that's actually gonna wrap up my series for getting started with FPGA development here, uh, specifically using the Vivado toolset and the RDZ7 from Digilent. Uh, thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you next time. Bye.